first, I would like to introduce our moderator. Anna Quinn is the author of The Night Child. Her poetry and essays have appeared in Psychology Today, Writer's Digest, Washington 129th Anthology, uh, The Alone Together Anthology, Comfort in the Time of COVID, and more. Uh, and our featured author tonight is Carol Smith. Uh, Carol is an award-winning journalist and editor for NPR affiliate KUOW Radio in Seattle. She has worked for the Seattle Post Intelligencer and written for the LA Times. Her newspaper work has won dozens of national and regional awards and has been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize seven times and her writing has appeared in more than a dozen literary journals. Smith was recently named Editor of the Year by Public Media Journalists Association. One of Carol's great passions is working with KUOW's youth radio group, Radioactive, which teaches high school students from diverse backgrounds to tell their personal stories for radio in their own voices. And we're here tonight to celebrate this book, Crossing the River, Seven Stories That Saved My Life. Please welcome Anne Quinn and Carol Smith. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Thank you for hosting this event. We really appreciate it as writers to have you here. Hi, Carol. Hi, Anna. I've been thinking about you all week. And how are you feeling with this first week of launching your beautiful book into the world? Well, thank you. It's been just sort of a whirlwind of emotions, um, but I have felt so much love and support from from people, and it's been um, it's been a long time in the works, and so it feels really good to have it out in the in the world at at last. So I'm I'm really excited. Yeah, it's a lot of emotions to put a book out, and especially one that um, is so intimate as yours. And I, I really admire that because it, it does, it takes a lot and it takes some preparation. Did you, how did you prepare yourself for that kind of? Uh, I did a lot of walking. <laughs> I've been walking around my neighborhood and uh, just trying to remember to breathe, you know, that, uh, that, you know, the, these are emotions that I'm experiencing, but they're very universal emotions. And so there are people out there who are are going to feel connected to this, and um, and I I feel their support already, and so that's that's been really helpful. Yeah, yeah, and I I know it will continue to be. You're just going to make, and already are making such a difference in people's lives. It's really I'm so proud of you. I want to say before we continue <laughs> that Carol and I are high school friends. And we, the interesting thing is that we lived on the same street. We had the same last name at the time. My name was Smith. We kind of looked alike, the same height, same color hair, maybe a few freckles. It's possible we might've dated the same guy. <laughs> um, and a lot of people thought we were sisters. And so it was really fun. We, we hung out a lot after school. And, um, but then we went on to have our, our own lives and did not connect until about a decade ago when I bought the bookstore in Port Townsend and connected with Carol. And she came to a workshop and we met and discovered we were both writers and it's just been really fantastic how our lives have circled back together. Yeah, it really has been. I think that's, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, it's, you You know, you talk about all these different events in your book too, how synchronicity works and people come together in different ways. And I really believe that, that we do that in our lives. And so it's just so wonderful to be here with you today. And. Um, we'll see if our English teacher shows up. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> so anyway, on to your story. I think a, a beautiful way to start would be to hear you read your, your prologue because um, it'll give our audience a, a really strong sense of your story and also introduce us to Christopher. So yeah. if you do that, that'd be wonderful. Okay, I will. I did not go to my son Christopher's school the day the nurse came to speak. 
Instead, I lay fetal-like on his bed, my face pressed to his sheets. The trace scents of crayons and band-aids, mud and baseball leather kept me breathing. I squeezed my eyes shut. Images clicked by like a reel in his viewmaster. Christopher riding a therapy horse, showing off his tricks, his arms sticking straight out, his head thrown back laughing. Christopher hiding rocks and shells under his bed, the found treasures of a seven-year-old. Christopher nestled next to me on the bed as we read books together in sign language. Again, story he would sign, tapping the fingertips of one hand into the palm of the other, then drawing his hands apart like he was pulling taffy. I'd laugh, knowing this was a tactic to avoid the dreaded bedtime and turn back to the beginning. It was the first day after winter break and overcast, the sun locked behind a scrim of gray. 15 miles away at George Washington Elementary School in Burbank, my friend Kathy, the mother of one of Christopher's best friends, stood in front of their first grade class. I could picture her signing as she spoke, by habit as the mother of a deaf child herself, and because many of the children were deaf like Christopher. I'd left my newspaper job in Seattle to move to Pasadena when Christopher was four years old, partly so he could go to this school with its side-by-side -side teaching in oral and sign traditions. I asked Kathy later to tell me what happened next. The children fidgeted in their blue and red school uniforms as a clutch of adults hovered around the edges of the classroom. They must have thought it strange to see so many grown-up faces. Along with Kathy, their principal was there and a psychologist from the hospital where she worked, as well as both their teachers. The teacher's eyes were red from crying. In the middle, Christopher's small wooden desk sat empty. The therapist, a man the children didn't know, held up a Raggedy Andy doll. Kathy asked the class what they observed about it. Then the man put the doll out of sight. Even though Raggedy Andy isn't here anymore, can you still remember things about him? Kathy asked. The game excited the kids. They shouted out the various adventures of Raggedy Andy and Ann from memory. Then one of the adults stepped forward to break the news. Something very sad had happened. The children quieted. Christopher had gotten sick and doctors couldn't help him anymore. Christopher died. Christopher died. The bed beneath me seemed to pitch and rock. I clutched my knees to my chest to keep from throwing up. I could not grasp the words. Each time I tried, they shattered into piles of indecipherable letters, like a child's alphabet puzzle spilled to the floor. I'd feared these words for seven years. Christopher was born with a tiny developmental defect in utero that had blocked his urinary tract, damaging his kidneys. That seemingly insignificant error set in motion a kind of butterfly effect, a cascade of medical sequelae we later could not escape. Yet he had survived, against odds, medical crisis after medical crisis, until now, until this, an abdominal obstruction unexpectedly claimed his life during the Christmas holidays while he was visiting his grandparents with his father. I could not forgive myself for failing at the only thing that mattered. I had survived, Christopher had not, and I wasn't there to say goodbye. In my fugue of grief, I could barely leave the house. Kathy had volunteered to help tell his class. She told the kids they could still talk about Christopher, about how he wore a Lion King costume, costume for Halloween that year, how his eyes were the golden brown of maple syrup, how he loved trains. She asked the class to write down their Christopher stories. Weeks later, I received their brief memories printed with crooked block letters on lined paper, illustrated with hearts and stars and stick figure children with oversized hands. He was my best friend, read one. He played tetherball with me. When I hurt my knee, he got me a band-aid, read another. Some were written with the curious syntax of a deaf child. Chris, heaven, go. In some of them, Christopher hovered in the right-hand corner of a bright blue sky. I envied them the comfort of these small tales. I had no language for stories, no words at all. Even the simplest statements didn't make sense anymore. Christopher is my son. Christopher was my son. I couldn't make either be true. The void of his loss was as indescribable as the darkness between stars. In the weeks and months after Christopher died, people stepped in to help. 
One of my old colleagues from the paper wrote Christopher's obit when I couldn't. Other friends advised me to move home to Seattle to be near family, but that would mean packing up his room and I could not bring myself to give his things away. When Christopher was little, I would sometimes discover my watch missing. I'd find the watch later, tucked into one of his many secret compartments for hiding schoolyard finds. Psychologists would have called this a linking object, something to soothe the separation. Now it was my turn to need a linking object. But what single magic talisman could conjure Christopher back for me? I clung to them all, his wind-up dinosaurs and slinky, his Batman band-aids and his red fanny pack with the blue asthma inhaler, his beloved Viewmaster. Instead of packing, I cleaned the room the way I would when he left for school breaks with his father, my ex-husband. Afterward, the room felt ready, ordered, welcoming. That made it worse. I craved the happy swirl of his energy when he'd come rushing home in the ensuing disarray. I missed the campsite he set up each night, preferring the adventure of sleeping on the floor to the comfort of his bed. I missed the lumpy piles of clothes and endless rearranging of toy train tracks that threaded through his room. His unchanging room taunted me with the truth of his absence. This is the paradox of grief. At first, I could not bear the thought of moving. Later, I could not bear to stay. So beautiful, Carol. So beautiful. I think of that one child's words, Christopher, heaven go. I just think it just, just gorgeous, beautiful, painful. <sighs> you wrote um, that after this, you know, after Aunt Christopher died, you went into a kind of an exile, you know, you isolated and which is of course, and um, but then over the decades, you emerged and began to open back up to people in your life, even deciding to write your story and Christopher's in a very personal way. And I wondered how that decision came about and um, how did you decide that now would be the time to press send? <laughs> Yeah, you know, early on, um, I did try writing uh, in the couple of years after Chris died. And I remember uh, a, a friend who was an agent back then telling me there's just too much raw pain in here for readers to be able to digest it and to just let that writing build up for me. And I would know at some point that um, that it could be a book or it was a book. And um, and that amount of time turned out to be about 20 years, you know, and that was the time that I needed to figure out what it was that I wanted to say and what it was I had to offer uh, about about this. And it's interesting because I had been I had recently gone back to um, a support group for for mothers who had lost children. And I remember listening to um, moms who had for whom the loss was really recent. Uh, talking and I could just so clearly see myself sitting there, um, you know, 20 some years earlier. And I realized that I had come somewhere and I did have some things to share. Um, the actual one of the other impetuses for the book is that the, um, the PIs closed in 09. Um, they closed the print part of the paper. And I remember being so sad about that and thinking about all of the people whose stories I had covered and who had really inspired and moved me. And I knew that there were these particular stories that had really called to me or had found me at the right time in my life that had really changed my own um, uh, views and given me a way to, to really um, move through the experience of, of grief. And I, I really wanted to share those stories. Um, and then the trick was figuring out kind of how to do that so so you had had contact with the seven people prior mm -hmm. and then when you processed through this and you decided you wanted to contact them and um and share that part of their story 
Yeah. Yeah. And it was really one of the really great things about um, doing this is I did get back in touch with them. These were all people whose stories I had covered as a reporter. And um, but as mostly as a reporter, we move on and you never know exactly what happens to people after the fact. And in the cases of these stories, they were ones that where I had really immersed in their lives for uh, in some cases as much as um, a year or more. Mm -hmm. And and so I was with them during this very intense period of time as they were going through something really difficult and transformative. And, um, and so, you, you know, I remember wondering over the years, like whatever happened uh, to, to, you know, so-and-so. And so it was really wonderful to be able to get back in touch with them and tell them what their stories had meant to me. Because in that reporter source relationship, you know, the, the, the person that, whose story you're reporting isn't usually asking you a lot of questions about your life. You know, you're asking a lot of questions about their life. So I, uh, and in, in many cases, they didn't know what, what, you know, that I had lost a child or that that might have anything to, at all to do with why I was interested in telling their stories. Yeah. That's so interesting. And I, you know, I was thinking about that because there's so much courage in this book, yours, as you make the decisions to tell the stories of others with medical obstacles and the parents who might relive those moments now in a different way with you. And because of your, your new layer of questions and then your own possible re-traumatization of listening to those stories. How did you, how did you move through that? How did that go for you? Uh, yeah, you know, um, it, it was, it was interesting for me to listen back to them talk about what the experience had been like for them. Um, and, uh, and in a, in a, and some of them have passed away. So I was in touch with their family. So I couldn't get this directly from them. But I think all of them felt like sharing. Um, and I should also say that all of these stories were ones that that really touched people at the time. And there was a lot of feedback at the time, you know, gratitude for to them for sharing their story. Because I think at the heart of all of this work is that um, you see when it's very empowering when you see yourself in somebody else you know it's it's uh when you see an experience that maybe you can't even articulate um being being lived by somebody else it it connects you you don't feel so so alone yeah. uh, so so they you know it was nice to hear back from them you know what the experience of sharing their stories had been had been like yeah so it became a very healing process for for everyone involved for all, all involved. it was for me i hope I, I think so i hope so well i can you can absolutely feel that that shared sense of story is at the heart of this book i, I can feel it's such a strong aspect of it i would love to hear a little more about christopher would okay. you would you read that snow scene yes if I hope I can find it. Um, 120. Yes. Yes. Um, in February, just before his second birthday, Seattle had a big snowstorm, his first. All that morning, we watched out the windows as the soft flakes swirled by. We practiced the sign for snow, baking a game of tearing paper into bits and tossing handfuls into the air, then letting them drift down around our shoulders. By afternoon, the snow had robed the yard in white. I bundled him into a little gray snowsuit and tucked his ears into a baby blue knit hat with reindeer on it. We pushed the back door open, scraping the snow away. His cheeks pinked up as soon as the cold air hit him, and he let out a little yelp of surprise. Gently, I sat him in the snow, lay down next to him, and scissored my arms and legs to make a snow angel. He watched me intently. Then I laid him on his back and moved his arms and legs so he could make his own. When we were done, we both lay there looking at the gray sky. He fluttered his hands like snow coming down. Later that night, he waved his arms in his crib like he was making an angel and patted his head, asking for a hat. It took a moment for it to sink in. He was talking to me. 
I could hardly stand to turn the light out. When I checked from the doorway a few minutes later, he was still babbling with his hands in the semi-dark. Semi By that spring, he was starting to read. The Three Bears was a favorite. He'd open to the first page and sign, birds fly, pointing to tiny bluebirds in the background of the picture that no one else would have noticed. He'd flip a few pages forward. Bear cold, he signed for porridge, shivering dramatically. Flip, flip to the back. Bed, sleep, he'd sign. He'd draw his hands closed in front of his eyes, then sweep his hands apart with a flourish. The end. The sign left his tummy momentarily exposed. I'd dive in and tickle him until we were both breathless with laughter. If we didn't know a sign, we made it up, a language between us, finding combinations of signs to express what we were trying to say. Expensive equaled the sign for money plus the sign for to throw away. Peaceful was the sign to become plus the sign for quiet. Earthquake was dinosaurs plus walking. Frank and I had planted a quaking aspen outside the Green Lake house the year we bought it. Every fall, the tree blazed a honey yellow that shimmered in the sun. Shiver leaf, Christopher called it. Gradually, he put together more complex sen sentences. Water, mix, weight, he signed to me one evening while we were drawing a bath. By the time Christopher was in kindergarten, we'd cobbled together a working sign vocabulary. If I stopped to rest or turn the page as we read books together, he'd pick up my hands and form them into shapes to make me keep going. When it was time for bed, he'd make the sign, palms together, cheeks, cheek resting on them like a pillow, except he'd use my cheek instead of his, our private joke. On kindergarten graduation day, Christopher pulled me over to introduce me to one of his friends. We stood together under the hot sun, the smell of tar wafting off the playground, waiting for his teachers to pass out diplomas spangled with glitter stars. Mama, my, Christopher signed to his friend, pressing his hand to his heart, then pointing at me, hearing closed, the sign for deaf. Me, same. Translation, my mother, deaf like me. I nearly danced on the pavement. He didn't see our worlds as separate after all. Yeah. That's so beautiful. Thank you for reading that. I love that memory. That's a really wonderful memory for me. Yeah. And for me, for me, it also goes to this idea that um, uh, that language is so important, so critical to be able to connect with people. And um, I was so terrified in the beginning when we found out that he was deaf that uh, we would be in these separate worlds and we wouldn't, you know, somehow it would come between us. And so it was language that was able to bridge that gap. And I think that's another thing that for me is, is woven through the book is the, is the idea of finding the language to, to communicate. Gosh, that's so true. And I, I can feel you doing that throughout the book. And I loved the way that you wove through the different memories in and out of the story. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, you know, how your movement from your journalistic qualities to your into the memoir zone. But um, before we do that, I would I would love to talk about your your title. And this mm. book cover, which is so beautiful, I have the galley, but um, the the real the hardback, the, the stars just really kind of shimmer, and there's there's a seven stars. But and you wrote about it. I don't know. Would you rather read about how it came about, or? Um, yeah. I, well, yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk about the title that um, yeah. connects to that. Um, I did want to say about that. I love the cover, and um, and I also love that the stars are like the little gold stars that you give kids. I know? thought that too. <laughs> Being a past elementary school teacher, that there's the gold star. Yeah, yeah. yeah really did you get a choice um, to have any say in your cover or with the publisher or how? No, that was the most wonderful thing. Um, they, I, I got an email one day that said, "Here, you know, some um, here's the cover draft," and um, I was really nervous to open it because there hadn't been any discussion with me. They, but they had read read the book, and uh, when I when I opened it, I cried because it was perfect. <laughs> so, um, the the idea of the 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 stars is another motif that runs th through the book and is imagery that that is important to the story. And um, and then it really struck me later when I realized 
that there are seven star, you know, there's seven stars in the constellation of the Big Dipper. So that was really special. Anyway, that, yeah. that's the beauty of having artists um, work on work yeah. on these kinds of things. They did a beautiful job. Yeah. So yeah. So the the title um, "Crossing the River" for me is is about is is about passages and. Um, I'll just read uh, read a little little bit, and this is from the first um, the the story about the first person I profile, um, and it's a little boy named Seth who had progeria, which is the rapid the disease that causes rapid aging in children. And uh, I was really drawn to his story because Chris had been ill a lot of his life, and yet we had never and I never been able to talk about what he might have been thinking about um, being a child who who might face death sooner than um, sooner mm -hmm. than later. Um, so seeing Seth as a regular 10 year old kid with a 10 year old's take on life showed me that children are focused on living, not dying, even when they're sick. And it's this focus, not the length of a life that makes it feel rich. I learned from watching Seth too that a, a life well lived is not dependent on its length, but rather measured by the love it generates. And by that measure, Christopher's life had been as full as any other. Seth forced me to slow down and see that children live their lives in moments and that a life can feel long in experience, no matter how long it is in days or weeks or years. You can see a life as cut short or you can see it as completed. They are two different things. That didn't take away my anguish. I still needed to learn how to live with that, but it did help me see it for what it really was, my missing him, not my having failed him. Those left behind mourn the loss of time with the ones we loved, the loss of our dreams for them, our wishes for the way things had turned out. The pain is real, the hole in my heart was real, but I began to take comfort in knowing that Christopher knew how well loved he was. I stopped obsessing over the trauma of Christopher's life. Years later, I would read in the New York Times that in the Khmer language, the term for giving birth means to cross the river. The phrase startled me. I put the paper down, then picked it up again and reread it. Exactly, I thought. This gave me a way to describe my life back then. Losing Christopher was like having to make the dangerous journey back across the river. Every day felt like drowning. There were times I wanted to yield to it, to go into the stillness below the rush of the current and watch the light fade from beneath the surface. Rep reporting stories like Seth's became my lifeline. It kept me above the waves, kept me from giving in. These people I reported on were the ones who showed me the way back across the river. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's where the title came from. And yeah. I, I, for me, the river became again a running metaphor uh, of this sort of boundary between worlds and how, you know, f when you um, give birth, especially for the first time, you, you know, it's a dangerous thing for a lot of women. And, um, and when you get to the other side, you're in a new world where you don't have any um, experience and you have to learn, you know, figure things out and learn how to navigate. And, and for me, that was the same thing when I, uh, when when I lost him, the same thing for me for losing a child was uh, this this um, uncertainty about whether I was going to make it safely back to the uh, other side, to a place, to this utterly changed world where I needed um, help to figure out how I was going to get through. Yeah. Yeah. Seth's, um, that whole story was, well, you, you wrote quite in depth about him, I think four chapters about him and I could really feel his presence. And um, it also stood out for me how in spending time with him, how, how your own perceptions changed so much towards what Christopher was going through and what you were going through, even just, just the, the smallest moment became so extraordinary. For example, um, when the doctor asks Seth how old he was and you're there, it sounds, in the room and mm -hmm. 
in your mind, you're going through all the ages that Seth will never be. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, it feels so sad. And as a mother, I was doing that too. I was feeling like that's so, that's just so terribly sad. But then you witnessed Seth very proudly telling the doctor he's 10 and claiming his age as this wonderful accomplishment. And it changed something in you. Yeah. 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 That was really, that was quite a moment. I mean, he like, he was very tiny um, because one of the things that the, the, the disease process does is stunt the growth. So he just only came up to my waist and he drew himself up and he like puffed out his chest. Then he said, I'm 10, you know, and he really did own it. And it reminded me, um, Christopher was the same way. He was, his name sign was a, a circle over the heart. And he always introduced himself as Christopher seven um, or Christopher, whatever age he was at the time. And um, he was just really proud of it. And it made me suddenly realize that I had always been looking at the deficit of the, like you said, the, the ages they wouldn't become. Mm -hmm. And instead of looking at, from their point of view, the ages that they 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 were, that they were um, experiencing and, and um, you know, their, to, to them, their life felt really long already. So yeah. that was very it, comforting. It was, it was beautiful. And it's something I really wanted to take in you know, because it, it, it kind of encapsulated a lot of what you're writing about in this being present with your life, being present with your pain, that part of being present with your pain is how you can move through, you know, and when you realize that children's preoccupations are not our preoccupations, I loved what you wrote about that, because that's exactly true you know and that Seth's focused on being on living was everything I just I thought it was all so very beautiful and I, I thank you for that and I know I'll be reading that again and again I was constantly writing down little quotes I put all over my writing wall <laughs> to help me remember because you know we're all we all go through traumas especially this last year and um those reminders that I don't think we can ever get enough of, of staying present in the moment are just so helpful. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for that. There was another moment. Um, well, there's so many moments in your book that just really moved me and changed it. But there's one where you were in a hair salon. And I'm wondering if you would read that. That's on page 53. Yeah. Um, yeah. This happened a lot. Um, do you have children? The question startled me from my trance in the salon where I, where I was getting my hair cut. I shifted uncomfortably under my black cla plastic cape, sending a cascade of damp hair clippings to the floor. It was the first time I'd been to this hairdresser. Her silver scissors had paused above my head and her eyes stared expectantly at mine in the mirror. Behind her, I could see a line of other chairs filled with women of various ages, their hair festooned with foil or hidden under bubble dryers. The hum of women's chatter and the whine of blow dryers filled the room. Fragments of conversation floated toward me, snippets about college applications, preschool drop-offs, the problem with video games. My throat felt suddenly dry. I coughed to cover my hesitation. No, I kept my face composed. She immediately went back to snipping. You're lucky, she said, and launched into a tale about her teenage son who had recently taken her husband's car for a spin without permission and crashed into the neighbor's fence. It was quite a scene. She chuckled as she ran through the details. I tried to smile along, but catching a glimpse of myself, it looked more like a grimace. Two high spots of color had bloomed on my cheeks and my eyes were burning. I closed them and was glad she couldn't see my hands beneath the drape my fingernails digging into my palms to keep from crying. Each time someone asked me about kids, I struggled for what to say. There was always a split second of reckoning as I considered whether the person asking needed to know. Saying yes meant the conversation could go nowhere without explaining that my son had died. By the time it sunk in, there would be an awkward silence all around. I could see people wishing they hadn't asked, see, see them trying to rewind the moment. Oh, I'm so sorry, they'd say, and make excuses to end the conversation. 
They clutched their own children tighter as though my misfortune were somehow contagious. I had violated the taboo. If I said no, it was like denying Christopher had ever lived, a second kind of death. Daily life was a minefield. The question came all the time, especially if children were around, at parties, in line at the grocery store, at the post office. The question always led to another unspoken one. I stared at myself in the mirror. Who was I if I wasn't a mother anymore? Hmm. Wow, well, it's a lot. As you said, a minefield. And I could feel, you know, through your words that, that your struggle to integrate that person that you are inside with, as you wrote, the child is, childless person the world saw. How did you, how did you go about doing that? How, what was that process like? Well, you know, the, the thing that was really helpful for me or where I had that kind of epiphany was I, I was reporting some stories about um, from the burn ward about um, uh, people who had suffered severe burns and in particular facial burns where um, the, there was significant scarring. So the face they presented to the world was suddenly very different than the face that they used to. And, and I realized that sort of emotionally, that's how I felt. The, my, my face to the world was, uh, was, was different, not physically, but uh, emotionally. I, um, and there was this disconnect between how others saw me and how I saw myself. So it was in, in the course of reporting their story though, that I, I kind of came to realize that there are things that are immutable in us that um, sometimes these really huge challenges or traumas that we go through uh, sort of force you to identify what it is at your core that doesn't change. And, um, and for me, um, I, I finally understood that one of the things that hadn't changed is I was still a mother mm -hmm. and I always would be a mother. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> Tremendous. Yeah. Wow. Oh. All right, well, we're gonna switch gears a little. And um, I also wanna say, we're gonna open up the questions in a few minutes. So if you're out there and you have a question you'd like to ask Carol, please put them in the Q&A and then um, we'll look at those in a few minutes. So, uh, Carol, you've taken some amazing paths in your life and your path to reporting hasn't really exactly been a straight one. <laughs> um, your, your father was a scientist. Yes. And your mother an English major, which is mm -hmm. one of the reasons I love going to your house. Yes. <laughs> very, lots of books. <laughs> it was a very grounding experience. Yes, <laughs> lots of books. And um, leading kind of you though to grow up kind of divided in your interest and getting degrees in chemistry and then plant pathology. Yes. Talk about how this led you to journalism. <laughs> yeah. Um, to medical journalism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, when I was I was in graduate school and I was studying plant pathology and um, I began uh, writing about the research that was going around on around me and it it um there was a moment when i and i was sending out i was thinking well i would like to you know be a writer and so i was sending out these little stories and they were all being rejected and then one day uh, i went out to the uh, this is back when um, people mailed things and i went out to my mailbox and there was this envelope from garden magazine in the, new, the which was the magazine of the new york botanical garden and they had taken a story of mine and it was like you know i was thrilled and excited and, and felt like, okay, this is a path that could open, um, open for me. And what it was is I love science and science actually had opened a lot of um, sort of a metaphoric world for me, mm -hmm. given me ways to describe uh, things. Um, but I didn't love the process of doing the science as much as I loved like reading about the science or writing about the science. So, um, which, my, my dad understands now, so <laughs> that I didn't become the scientist in the family. Uh, so um, anyway, I, I ended up getting a, a 
a fellowship to, to do an internship in the newsroom. And I went to the Charlotte Observer and it was actually I, I, the first time I'd ever been in a newsroom. And it was, um, I was just really energized by the, uh, the commotion and the sense of camaraderie and the sense of urgency and this sort of bonding that happens when you're all working on deadline and, and uh, writing about things that you're passionate about. And so uh, I just never looked back. Um, so that's how I, and so then I I, your nominations later. <laughs> uh, you just did an amazing job. Yeah, it was. So, oh, go ahead. No, I just, I feel really lucky too. And the PI in particular was a really special place. And then when they closed, um, I, I, didn't have a plan B because I love journalism. You know, I didn't have another career that I wanted. And so I was really fortunate. I, I um, was able to do, I was the world's oldest intern at KUOW and I learned radio and I um, I just fell in love with it. It's, it's such a narrative medium. And so it was, um, it, you know, it was a nice, a nice transition for me. And I feel really yeah. lucky. Yeah. So what, what was it like to move from a journalistic style, which my impression is incredibly objective. Well, it used to be. Right. <laughs> but, um, a journalist, <laughs> that's another subject. A journalist who specialized in medical stories into, into shifting into this form of memoir where the, uh, the whole you know, intention really is to dig deep into emotions, just keep digging deeper and deeper for meaning. And um, what was that like? And you you went back and forth throughout yeah. your, your I can your journalist hat was on, then I saw your memoir hat, and I saw all these different yeah. styles and forms. How was that for you? Um, it was hard. It was um, and I had I had very good people who may or may not be on this call. Um, Jameson and Jennifer, um, who who really pushed me on, on that and and really um, you know I, I think as a journalist, one of the things that I prided myself on is being able to write in such a way that people could um, feel what it was like for me to be there and they could observe it as though they were observing it with their own eyes and they could sort of draw their own conclusion about what was happening. But what the transition that I had to do was sort of close that narrative distance was to um, put people inside my body and let them feel what I was experiencing and as, as I was going moving through this reporting journey. And, and that was hard because it also meant re-experiencing a lot of really difficult um, moments in, in my life. And uh, I mean, writing this was excruciating at times. And, um, but the really beautiful thing that came out of it is that um, you alluded earlier to how sort of I shut down, I went into exile in the, in the beginning years after Chris died and, and um, but really in the process of writing the memoir, I found him again. And, and in the beginning, you know, I had, uh, I had put away all his pictures and I tried really hard not to be around or do anything that would trigger a memory because it was just too painful. Mm -hmm. And now, um, now I, I love the memories and I, you know, I love, I love it when people talk to me about what they remember. And um, I've been going through a lot of photos in the last, um, a uh, couple of months, and it's just been really, really great to be able to, um, to to have him with me. And I think that's the that's the journey that I went on is to to find a way to keep him with me, even as I let let go. Uh, so yeah, and that writing became that language to help you do that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's a pretty mysterious and magical and fantastic art you know, what writing can do for us. Yeah. You did it, you did it so well. You did, you really just transformed the whole, your whole experience. And before we go on to um, the questions, I, I would, I was hoping you could read one more excerpt. And um, I particularly was drawn to this one because you write about what happens to our sense of self when an outer circumstance, outer circumstances change particularly when the change is traumatic. Um, would you read that? It's on page 82, 83. Uh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, this is after I've been um, I've been reporting in the burn ward, and I'm remembering a moment um, that I had with with Chris, um, and uh, and we're we're in a park. Uh, one day, as I one day as we sat side by side on the swings, he asked for my camera, an old 35 millimeter I hauled around with me. Big picture, he called it in sign. I helped him lift the camera to his face and look through the lens. He swung around and pointed it at me. In the picture, I'm leaning back in the swing laughing. I see me through his eyes. I see me happy. I see me as his mother still. Having a child had changed me profoundly as it does every parent. After Christopher died, I didn't know how to integrate the person I was inside with the childless person the world saw. It felt like living behind a facade. This is something so many grieving people face, appearing recovered on the outside, but feeling destroyed on the inside. Fine, we say when people ask how we are doing, but it's a lie. John and Billy too had to wrestle with who they were when their inner and outer worlds no longer matched. I learned from them that the essence of who you are doesn't change when something in your outer circumstances changes. Indeed, those changes may reveal and enhance traits you hadn't known you had before. Becoming Christopher's mother had given me a new kind of strength. He'd taught me patience and acceptance. He'd shown me what endurance looked like. Now I needed those things if I was going to make it without him. In getting to know these burn patients, I began to see the ways I approached my life as a mother would, feeling protective of and wanting the best for young people I met and mothering others. Embracing that instead of denying it, let me hold on to my identity as a mother in the world. No matter who else I might become in my life, I would always be Christopher's mom. I balanced the photo on a shelf next to my bed. Then I went back to my study and dug out a wallet sized school picture. I slipped it into my purse next to his library card and band aids. The next time someone asked whether I had children, I would say yes. This is my son, Christopher. So, hmm, thank you. Thank you for that. Hmm. Let's look at, there's a couple questions. I think you, you might have answered uh, one of them a little bit in one of our questions. This one's from Jennifer. She said, Carol, I originally met you in a fiction writing class over 20 years ago. Hi, Jennifer. I remember. Were you originally thinking of fictionalizing this story? And if so, what steered you back to memoir? This was touched on a bit by Anna's first question, but I was curious about your journey from fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to reading your book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, that was a wonderful uh, class. That was a year long um, certificate program in fiction. And um, you know what that class did for me? I, to answer your question, no, I'd never thought about specifically fictionalizing this story. Um, I, I do, um, ex I am exploring fiction. I have explored fiction. Um, but what that class did for me is teach me um, really narrative structure and how to write in scenes. And that was something that uh, that I was able to bring to bear on the the the, the stories that I was reporting. Um, to, so I was transitioning as a reporter from being very, um, very much kind of account driven to being um, scene driven. So yeah, that was a great class. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, with all the different forms and it really, it seems to matter the form that we choose and it matters that we listen really in our bodies and in our minds for the form that's coming through and whatever it is, I really believe it's the right form, you know, whether it's um, through essays or poetry or fiction or memoir. And um, I'm really happy to see people exploring all the different forms to tell their story that it doesn't, there's no really one way to do it anymore. There's just, you know, they're all, all different ways and hybrids of yeah. a form. And um, it's, it's fascinating to see how form can influence content and content can influence form. So it's, it's very fascinating. Sure. Question from Audrey. She writes, no, no, this is from, oh yes. 
She says, hi, Carol. I'm so sorry for your loss. One loss that has always ha haunted me was my full-term baby brother named Michael who never came home from the hospital with SIDS. And then she asks, I'm interested in your encounter with General John, and I don't know if I'm gonna to try to pronounce that, Shalise Kashvili. Shali Kashvili. He always seemed like a sincere person. So I, th I think she just wants to know a little about that encounter. That was an incredible story. People can read yeah. about too when they get the book because it's a it's a long uh, and very in depth fabulous story. But why don't you talk about it? Yeah. Well, first, I'm so sorry. It's just really hard to be. You know, uh, child loss is 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 you know it has ripple effects through families and siblings um, have a special burden that that they carry. Um, yeah, the general, I remember I, I, uh, the story about the general, um, I entered his life when um, he had a massive stroke. And so um, he was, uh, he had, you know, reached the pinnacle of the US military. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs under Clinton. And um, he, he was this extremely powerful, in my mind, and intimidating figure. And so I, I went, um, I was going to uh, sort of follow him through his rehab uh, for the, the stroke injury. And I remember being just really nervous driving over to the hospital to meet him for the first time uh, because I was afraid I'd be late or, you know, like somehow I wouldn't, I don't know what I thought he would do, like make me drop and do 40 or something, but I got there and he was just the, the sort of, um, first of all, he was, he was kind of, um, you know, because he'd had a stroke and he was in a wheelchair, he seemed very kind of small. And I had in my mind this very large person. And so he was not intimidating at all. And he was also very um, kind of very soft spoken. And he had a very um, uh, dry sense of humor, very kind of wit, wit. And so he's facing this really awful situation for somebody, anybody where he had um, lost the use of uh, one half of his body and he was having to, I met him as he was going through therapy to learn to walk again. And uh, I remember after that first um, um, meeting, he's, he had walked down these parallel bars, you know, like taken four steps and he was just exhausted. He was dripping sweat. And, and he looked at me, he said, it's worse than boot camp, you know? And so he put me right at ease and, um, and he was just, uh, he was, he was a good storyteller and um, yeah, he was a fascinating person. I was really fortunate I got a chance to, to meet him. Mm -hmm. And how did that experience impact your journey? Yeah, so I had, um, I had kind of grown up with this um, notion that somehow, you know, cause and effect, if you did the right things, you know, the right, things would follow, you know, good things would happen. And of course, we all know that like life doesn't work out that way. And uh, that really random things and, and uh, bad things happen in, in people's lives. And it's not always something that you can control or foresee. And so, but what that did for me is um, I was, I was terrified of taking risks, because I sort of, I, I was in this place where the worst thing that I could imagine had happened to me. And I, I was afraid as I you know, emerged from my shell that even, you know, that some worse thing could happen to me. So it was, it was learning how to balance that, you know, to, to take risks and balance what you can control and what you can't control in your life. Um, so, so that was what I, I learned from him. And the thing that he showed me through watching him work on his recovery was um, how much discipline it takes to, to try and um, that you do have to work at recovery, that it doesn't just happen, you know, and it's little tiny steps at, at a time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that, of course, the discipline came from his, his uh, upbringing and his background in the military. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, yeah, what a story. What a story that was. Um, ML asks, did you keep a journal during Christopher's childhood? And um, after after he died, yes, uh, I kept a very um, kind of um, one of these journals, like um, that a lot of us writers do, where it's written on scraps of paper and backs of envelopes, and it gets shoved in files. And um, 
So I had a lot of, of kind of random notes. Um, and then after he, after he died in the first year, I kept quite a, a detailed journal that was a lot of it was letters that I wrote him is a way of kind of trying to figure out what it was that I was feeling and going through. So, um, uh, but it wasn't like the, a classic, like every day I made an entry um, uh, kind of a journal. It was more just these almost fragments of thoughts and or, or impressions, or I remember um, running across in a file, a list of things that were in his room. And that actually became the genesis of that prologue. Um, and, you know, I didn't want to I knew if I started putting things in boxes, I didn't, I didn't, I needed something tangible I could hold. So I wrote it down on a piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah. What a gift. And the other thing that sort of became um, my, my working journal is I had all, uh, I had all these, you know, the paper that accumulates for any parent in, in the life of their child. So I had, um, you know, his school reports and his medical, his, you know, chart records. And um, I had how to's on how to, you know, um, do CPR on babies and all the things that, that you get handed that you're trying to process as you're, as you're going through the experience of raising your, your child. And those things became really important kind of um, triggers for, or cues for me in remembering what, what I had experienced as I went along. Uh -huh. Wow, beautiful. ML also asks or says, you wrote a wonderful piece in the Washington Post about feeling like a ghost mother. Mm -hmm. Can you let, elaborate a bit on that here? Um, yeah, hi, ML. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, we all, I think everybody remembers that because uh, it w went around the world, the story of um, Talika and her, um, her baby calf that she carried or she pushed through the water for 17 days. And uh, for me, um, we, you know, that, that story dominated our news meetings for, for weeks. And I remember standing around in the newsroom and everybody's talking about what's the next angle we're going to do and, you know, how are we going to... Um, push the story forward. And I would just, I, it would just, it, sometimes I would have to leave or just turn away because it, it's, it was so um, visceral for me that, that people who've lost children carry their young forever. And this whale essentially embodied that so that people, um, you know, and people were responding to that. They were, they were feeling something as they watched her carry, carry her dead calf. Um, so that became the genesis of, of that piece. And, and the root of it is that there isn't, and this gets, um, it, you know, sh shared a lot amongst the, the um, in, in bereavement groups, but, um, you know, there isn't an actual word in English for like a widow or an orphan for somebody who loses their child. And there's been some movement in recent years to kind of adopt a, a word from another culture, or another language that, that may suit that or describe that, but, but there really isn't a, a word for it. And, and we're just kind of invisible. Um, so the whale made it visible. Yeah. 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 You're so right. We don't have a word for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, speaking of the Washington Post, and also that it's getting time to close up here. But um, I did want to, you wrote recently in the Washington Post, another essay. So Carol has two essays on the Washington Post. You, if you haven't read them yet. Well, one, is, one is on today, I think. Or, yeah, they're not both on Washington Post, but yeah. Oh, but the I, other one on closure? Yeah, that one is in, um, in today. Today.com. Oh, okay. yeah. In that article, and in your book, you write about uh, that as a society, we're obsessed with closure mm -hmm. and that closure is a myth. Mm -hmm. And you also wrote that the well-known stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance have kind of formed the basis of how we get through um, our grief. And I, I agree with you on the... Um, that it isn't a linear 
process at all. And um, that most people who have encountered trauma can tell you that, that the stages don't go like that. And I think Kubler, as you said, has since said her model was misunderstood, but it still has taken root in our collective psyche and as the way things are supposed to go. And I really appreciated that you um, talked a lot about how that just isn't so. And I'm glad that the conversations are happening all over about how everyone does grief differently. And I wondered, how do you think of, of closure now? What, what, are, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, um, yeah, it, 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 I, don't, I don't like the, the word because it doesn't describe what happens. And I think of it more, um, um, it isn't about closing off or shutting down. It's about integrating. Um, your grief into, into your life and learning to live with it and learning to and letting it change you in ways that, um, that, you know, that open you kind of open your heart to other people. And so I, I don't think of it so much as a closing as a, as an opening. Um, and it is really true that, um, that, that it's, it's moving through grief is a very fluid thing and it's very mixed states, you know, people, will be um, in multiple phases at the same time. You can be um, you can be in acceptance and still be sad. You can be in denial and be angry. You know, it's it's not either or discrete stages. So, um, so yeah, I think it's just learning to to know that whatever you're passing through, you'll pass through again, but you'll also be in another another place in another moment. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And it's such a universal experience. I mean, I think there was a, a study out um, of USC just a few weeks ago that talked about how for every COVID death, there's like nine newly bereaved family members. And, uh, uh, you know, the circle of, of people who are grieving in our, our world right now is, is just only, you know, growing. Yeah. And you use the symbol of the circle we mm. talked about circling around and um, old grief becomes new grief and becomes old grief becomes new grief. And and um, I like visualizing like that. I, I see it too as a spiral. Mm. And I've noticed that, you know, each time I spiral through part of a trauma, it, it, does, it lessens something, strengthens something, changes. It becomes a new layer of, of meaning. And yeah. um, I love thinking about thinking about it like that. Um, when you spoke about COVID, I, before we go, I just wondered in this time of, you know, really unprecedented loss with the whole world grieving at once, what, what, what would you tell us? What, what would you most want us to know about navigating loss? Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think just that, again, the recognize that, um, that, Loss, loss is loss, and that there's no kind of equivalency, and and so um, what, whatever I mean, everybody in the in the pandemic has lost something, whether it was, um, you know, their routine or their contact with other people, or all the way up to losing relatives and loved ones, and um, and and whatever that loss is for the for for you it's it's um really deep and really personal and um we need to reach out to people and sort of meet them where they are with what their loss is and not not like make higher i guess the where i'm trying to go is there aren't necessarily hierarchies like your loss is not worse than my loss kind of thing it's it's like recognizing that we're all vulnerable um and I think that's what the pandemic has shown us is that we're all vulnerable and we are also all connected. And so it's just sort of recognizing and looking for, you know, being able to see um, see our experiences in one another. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Yeah, that, that's beautiful and important. Well, I, I wanna thank you so much, Carol. And thank you. Your, your book is, a tremendous testament to the power of shared stories. And it reaffirms that really we're never alone and also how powerful it is to be present in our pain with each other and we can't rush it. And in those moments when we feel 
that we can't breathe or can't think, you know, we, that we can have that hope that that hope can be found in unexpected places when we, as you said, when we reach out to each other. So yeah. thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank Turn you. Turn it over to Dishali now. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you guys for a, a lovely conversation and thank you for sharing your story with us, Carol. Appreciate it. And um, to our audience, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we, we appreciate your support. Um, I will send the link uh, right now to the Village Books website um, where you can find Crossing the River. Um, and we Village Books in Fairhaven is also open every day until 8 p.m. Uh, for those, those of you in the Bellingham area, uh, feel, please visit us. Um, and I, I'll also put the link to the YouTube channel so you can uh, send show your friends this event um it will be uploaded in a, a few days um and we also have uh, all of our past virtual events on there as well um, and anna and carol is there any last words that you guys have at all no thank you so much for hosting us i really really appreciate it absolutely i do too thank you i, I love village books i just thank you. absolutely love it <laughs> beautiful place. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. And have a good night. Yeah. Bye. Bye.